Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for attending our keynote, uh, the last keynote, I believe, for the day. Um, I, my name is Aileen Arsilla. I am an analyst with GigaOM. I'm here to introduce Bob Brennan, who is currently um, a senior vice president at Samsung. He's heading the uh, Samsung System Architecture Lab, and, there, and he is leading the efforts to introduce new system and platform architectures to align with um, Samsung's products and research in memory. Uh, prior to that, he was the lead architect for the system on chip designs for Intel's uh, data center uh, business. Um, so um, without further ado, I will turn it over to Bob to, um, you know, to present his talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so hello, I'm Bob Brennan. Uh, first, a little bit about my background. I'm a technology enthusiast. That means I'm a geek. At home, I like to build servers, storage arrays, and likes. And my wife disagrees with me, but I believe your IT budget at home should be greater than the budget for your car. There's some disagreement. Are uh, you with me? OK. <laughs> um, part of this role, I was the lead architect or chief architect of Intel's microserver line. That was a disruptive innovation for the industry, which was pretty exciting. And now I believe we are at a multi-decade inflection point in both DRAM and flash technologies. And in that multi-decade inflection point, I believe that a new system architecture is going to be required to adapt to the needs of this new technology. So today, I'm going to step through the environmental need for increased bandwidth capacity and growth. I'm going to talk a little bit about DRAM, flash, and some new technology, and I'm going to end up with a tiered memory technology uh, or rack level architecture uh, that we're going to propose as a solution to many of these problems. So the world's kind of moving to the bookends, right? So it's pretty much all about mobile and the cloud. Um, you know, with, with, with great deference to the folks in client, the majority of the growth in the industry is driven by mobile and the cloud. This, in turn, is driving a tremendous need for memory uh, uh, DRAM and storage. I'm not going to go through all the examples here. They're entirely too small to read. But we see a trend in virtualization. We see that virtualization is driving the need for capacity in servers. And we see um, a lot of uh, things driving bandwidth demand, uh, like in mobile. We have, on the left-hand side, this device in my pocket. Well, it's not in my pocket, so I guess it's still in my bag. But that device is driving towards ultra-high definition. So a mobile device driving ultra-high definition. That, in turn, is driving video capture. That, in turn, is driving larger files. That, in turn, is driving the need for bandwidth in the handhelds and capacity in the servers. The capacity trend in handhelds is more linear than it is exponential. However, in many of the server applications that we look at, the capacity demand in servers is exponential. And so we're trying to figure out how do we satisfy the bandwidth and capacity demands that we see in the industry. So as such, we look at DRAM technology and what's happening. So these are what I call the trade-off triangles in memory and flash. So in DRAM, it's bandwidth, latency, capacity, and power as the invariant. In flash, it's IOPS, capacity, and endurance. That's your fundamental kind of uh, trade-off, if you will. So these elements are things that we have to work with. Now, if you could let go on one of these parameters, you could optimize a lot. But unfortunately, we're not going to be allowed to let go of any of these parameters. So in terms of the first trend, which is bandwidth on the very top, and we look at DRAM scaling, we see there's around DDR3200, which is the end of DDR4, we see that the bandwidth scaling gets to be exceptionally difficult. Now, every time some executive stands here on the stage and claims there's a wall, there's a bunch of smart people here in the audience who decide that they're just going to go ahead and move that wall. So I won't say that beyond 3200 is impossible. 
What I will say is that it will limit the amount of capacity that you can take and hold within a system. So <clears throat> that creates a challenge that, okay, maybe we can get beyond 3,200, but we're not gonna be able to do that with you know, four DIM per channel or something like that. So we have to have a new solution to overcome this sort of bandwidth cliff that's coming up. Next, DRAM capacity scaling is becoming more and more difficult. Um, <clears throat> we are continually innovating in our factories to try and figure out how to get the basic capacitive structure of DRAM to continue to scale. And we're trying to figure that out in real time. The application requirements that many of the people in this room drive are not going to allow us to increase latency significantly to DRAM. So the DRAM latency has been roughly constant for the past uh, approximately 15 years. Not exactly true, but close. And as a result of that, as we move forward and we look at new memory architectures and topologies, we're not going to be allowed to you know, sort of put latency off the cliff, if you will. So that's a fundamental constraint of our applications we have to keep in consideration. So one of the ways to solve the bandwidth problem is to go wide, right? So in mobile, what's going to happen is the mobile platforms are going to move to wide I.O. of some sort. Initially, they're going to move to low power DDR4. And in that way, they're going to have a bunch of high speed bandwidth close to the processor. And they're going to have their bulk memory in a two tier structure. So they're going to have wide I.O. close, low power DDR4. Servers, I would submit, eventually have to consider a different architecture. So servers, if they go greater and greater in bandwidth, eventually you're going to run into a problem. And eventually you could adopt something like HBM. And when and how that happens exactly is not clear. Now, both of these solutions are not changing the fundamental structure of DRAM. What they're doing is they're organizing DRAM differently in a different way. Basically, they're going wider with the same fundamental DRAM structure. And that's necessary, but now we have a capacity problem. So, the way we can overcome the bandwidth uh, and capacity problem is by creating a tiered memory structure. So, what we'll have is we'll have a super uh, high bandwidth, high performance tier that will be close to the CPU. And then we'll have a high capacity tier, which is further from the CPU. Um, so in the, in the mobile, it kind of looks like wide I.O. and low power DDR4 as an example. And in servers, I think we're going to need a new architecture of some sort, which is going to have DDR close to the server. And it's going to have some kind of newer memory further away from the server, some kind of a tiered uh, structure. And this is a, a very big shift in how DRAM has been designed in systems for the last two decades. We've had CPUs, caches, memory, and that's been about it for two decades. Now we're actually shifting the science of caching to the external buses. And that's kind of, it's kind of fun, especially if you're a, a DRAM system guy like we are. <laughs> so again, the first step is we're going to split memory into a high performance tier and a high capacity tier. Okay, now that we've sort of accomplished that, or I hope we can, let's look at flash technology and some of the challenges we see there. In flash technology, we have also challenges in scaling. So two-dimensional scaling in flash has gotten to be exceptionally difficult. Shrinking the fundamental storage structure of flash has gotten to be harder and harder. And there are ways that you could do this that would be exceptionally expensive on the far end. So the cost of patterning would be astronomical, and that would destroy the nice cost curve we've provided to the industry for flash all these years. The other problem we have is endurance. So in flash, as we look at SLC, we started out pretty well. And over time, it became more and more difficult to give the endurance required by the applications. So it was approximately, I think, 2008 or 9. I don't know exactly when. I wasn't at Samsung at the time. 
where our brightest scientists and a billion dollars, by the way, got together and said, how are we going to solve this problem? And that's when they came up with the innovation of uh, vertical NAND technology. So vertical NAND technology moves from 2D planar scaling to three-dimensional scaling. It gets twice the density and write speed, half the power consumption, and 10 times the endurance. The way it does this is by drilling these exceptionally long holes, if you will, and stacking the dies on top of each other. So just to kind of put that in perspective a little bit as to how that looks, there's these, these tiny little channels that's drilled kind of into the silicon, and the silicon is kind of stacked on top of each other. And that, let's see if I can get this to work. That gives you about 50,000 by 50,000 holes. And overall, that gives you about two and a half billion holes on something the size of my finger. That's pretty cool. And we're pretty excited about it because we believe this is a breakthrough in technology. The significance to the people in this room who design systems is that we believe that with this breakthrough technology, that we're going to be able to continue to scale and flash. So today, we've already announced the first 128 gigabit device. We have a SATA drive. And over time, we're going to enter what we call the era of Terra. Terabit devices, terabits flash for terascale systems. Over time, we believe that this is going to accelerate the transition from hard disk drive to flash. In fact, we think that with the exception of huge data, you know, 30 petabyte systems and the likes, that this scaling capability is going to turn all the other storage in the system into flash. So in fact, I'll say it here probably for the 10th time, this is the decade of flash. This is the decade of transitioning all of our systems to flash. And by the end of this decade, we'll look back and go, wow, spinning media is great for these massive databases. It's still going to be there. So is tape. But this is the era of flash, if you will. OK. So if you look at flash, we have capacitive scaling. We have endurance solved by three-dimensional stacking. There's one more aspect that I didn't cover in depth because it doesn't really fit into this talk about how do we keep up with the IOPS. And the way we keep up with IOPS is two, two things. Number one is we scale the interfaces to PCI Express. So we go from uh, SATA to PCI Express, et cetera. And the second way that we do that is we have a tremendous amount of intelligence that we're putting down into the flash devices. And as we push intelligence into the flash devices, this is going to be an opportunity for us to think about what kind of computation would best be done near the storage. So st basically, stay tuned in this space. We've got a lot of stuff going on. And think about intelligent SSDs of the future. OK, so now we've got flash and DRAM. And this is kind of the first step in the system. I guess it was, I don't know, I think it was about four years ago that everybody came out with a flash hard disk drive combo. Uh, what I see happening today is even the big data uh, folks are basically putting flash as a front end in front of disks. Uh, they're using the random performance of the flash. I think somebody once said that virtualization is a data blender. And what they mean by that is it's basically thrashing a disk such that a, a disk with a normal head can't keep up with the data. So Flash will take care of your data blender on the top, and it will be backed by a tier of hard disk behind it. And I, I think this is pretty much going on today. Now, there's another trend today I'll get to in a second. But we're not done yet. So, so this is kind of our first step. There is a new memory technology <clears throat> that we call persistent performance. So if you look at hard disk drives, you look at uh, last level cache and DRAM. So I should explain the graph, excuse me. So on the lower part of the graph, you have bandwidth increasing. 
And on the upper part of the graph, you have latency increasing. So as an example, a hard disk drive is very low in bandwidth and very high in latency. A processor, last level cache, is very high in bandwidth and very low in latency. And what we saw as flash technologies deployed, we noticed that uh, you know, they, they bring us a step closer, and that's great, uh, towards DRAM. But still, there's a whole space between flash and DRAM where we think there's going to be innovation. So there's multiple technologies that we're investigating that we call persistent performance that get close to the capabilities of DRAM but have the persistent characteristics of flash. Now, one of these technologies that we're examining is called STTM RAM. And for those that follow the industry, a lot has been said and written about STT and other flavors of technology. It's pretty cool. I mean, we've got uh, pretty good uh, cost characteristics close to uh, DRAM in this particular slide. Um, the only issue is, is that it's not quite yet mature. So <clears throat> Samsung and other leaders in the industry are investing quite a lot in bringing STTM RAM to market. And we believe that the advent of this technology is going to create a brand new tier in the memory topology. So we started earlier saying by we used to have basically CPU, DRAM, and disk. Now we move to a tiered DRAM. Now we replace disks with tiered flash and disks. And in the last step, what we do is we create one more tier, which is the persistent performance tier. So in the end state, and this is in this decade, this is soon, this is within, I, I won't predict the exact date, but it'll, prior to 2020, we're going to have that high performance DRAM tier. We're going to have a persistent performance tier. And the majority of storage will be done in intelligent flash arrays. Now, there's multiple companies here. I mean, if I threw a baseball outside of this room, I'd probably run into an all flash array startup. I mean, there's many of them out there, and they're doing tremendous uh, innovation. Uh, and we love them all as long as they use Samsung Flash, of course. At the same time, we believe that there's going to be a new class of persistent performance. And that's going to change the way software is written. So that persistence performance, it's going to be byte addressable. And we think that the persistence and the byte addressability is going to be a shift in the paradigm of how software is written. Uh, and so that's pretty cool. So that's kind of an end state. This is kind of a end of the decade kind of uh, picture, although the all flash arrays are happening uh, today. Now, by the way, I'd like to tie this back into the Facebook talk we had earlier. So Facebook approached the tiering problem from a totally different aspect. But we arrived at the same answer. And the answer is that we have to tier between levels of flash, DRAM, and storage. And then we have to keep that tiered architecture and move that forward as the technologies evolve. So uh, Matt and I promise you we did not coordinate, but uh, we, we said the same thing. So that, that's pretty good. So let's see. I think that might be it. Wow, I ran through that talk which gives lots of time for questions and answers. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>